Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Score Fantasy Football Podcast presented by Subway. I'm your host, Justin Boone, the lead fantasy analyst at The Score. Joining me today, as always, is The Score's David P. Woods, a man who dropped James Conner in our main league last week, and he is regretting it now. Yeah, I'm full of regret right now. I mean, it was a complicated roster move I made in a pretty convoluted league. I needed to fill a spot for week one. I He was sitting at the end of my bench. I thought, you know, Le'Veon Bell, of course he's going to be there for week one. He was last year. It made sense at the time. It makes zero sense today. We're, I'm sure we're going to talk more about the Steelers backfield in this episode, but uh, let's just move on and maybe I can try to forget about that huge error that will haunt me all season long, potentially. Well, the one thing is you didn't have to do it. You could have waited to this week. You could have waited. We're going right to move on. We're going to move on. You could have waited until kickoff. Oh, and then someone else ended up picking him up off the waiver wire. Neither of us, unfortunately. Devastating way to start your season. I mean, Levy and Bell's going to be back in a couple days, right? A couple, a couple more days, maybe I'll, this will turn out okay? It seems like. We're going we're gonna to talk about that in a bit here. Today's a special podcast. Uh, this is our first video podcast, so you'll be able to still uh, listen to us uh, wherever you listen to uh, the podcast, but you're also going to be able to watch the video on the Score app if you like, and we're going to be doing this every Thursday, and we're going to be having guests on all these podcasts as well. Today, our guest is going to be Mike Taglier from Fantasy Pros. We're going to have him on a bit later. A huge thank you to our friends at Subway today. They provided us with these delicious paninis. It's fantastic. Really, really great during the show today to get us through here. On this episode, we are going to discuss, well, Woods' long-lost love, James Conner, for sure, and that whole Steelers backfield situation. And we're going to get Tags' thoughts on pretty much all the big fantasy questions that owners are facing heading into week one. But first, as always, let me remind you, if you like what you're hearing, you should subscribe to the podcast. When you do, toss a quick rating, give us a review. We really appreciate it. Let's look at some of the changes that I'm going to make on my rankings uh, that are going to be up on Thursday on the score. Let's first take a look at some of the notable risers and fallers that you're going to see. And this is our next level update segment, which is presented by our friends at Subway, who've upped the ante, the taste ante, with their new next level paninis. The first player is the guy that we've mentioned far too many times already, and that's James Conner. He's obviously going to be moving up. By the time you listen to this, it's possible that Le'Veon Bell has already reported. But even if he does, it's so late in the week at this point that I don't believe that they're going to give him any work. From what we're seeing, what we're hearing today, it seems like Bell is going to be holding out for at least a game, maybe longer than that. We'll talk about that in a second. I'm going to move James Conner up to RB12 in my rankings, a back-end RB1. And Bell is going to drop out completely for now until we get more. We also have a pretty good idea that Marlon Mack uh, isn't going to be playing this week. He's missed a month of practice with a hamstring injury. So I'm moving Jordan Wilkins up 11 spots to RB29. Still going to be a part of a committee, but he's going to enter the RB2 flex conversation. And finally, one player who is dropping for me is Marshawn Lynch. I know the Rams weren't great against the run last year, but this is a tough matchup for Oakland who... They, they just seem a little demoralized after trading away their best player, essentially. Um, I think that's going to be a tough game for them, and I'm moving Marshawn down into the 30s. I'm sure our guest has a ton of thoughts on all this stuff, so let's bring him on. As I mentioned, Mike Taglier of Fantasy Pros. Mike is one of the top analysts in the industry. You can find all his work over at Fantasy Pros. Tags, thanks for joining us. Oh, no, thanks for having me on, guys. I'm, I'm pretty excited to be part of the first video episode, even though I'm not in there eating the delicious paninis with you guys. Something that I would like video of is I believe you went golfing with another one of our friends in the industry, uh, Pat Fitzmaurice. How did that turn out? It went good, man. I mean, he brought me to a course that was like had elevation changes all over the place. Like I played the the 18 hole course and we had a co- uh, we had a cart. But just walking to my ball from the cart. I got done with the golf game, and it said I had walked like 20 flights of stairs. I was like, this is ridiculous, Pat. Uh, I would have brought him to a much easier course, but it was good, man. That's pretty fun. Week one is one of the most exciting times on the fantasy calendar, in my opinion. We finally get a look at some teams in real game action. And, you know, no matter how accurate we are with our projections all off season. there's going to be a lot of surprises this weekend. We can all agree on that. It happens every year, right? So... You need to be able to adapt to the new fantasy landscape. You know, you shouldn't be blindly holding on to your takes that you had in the offseason. That's just going to sink your team. 
I, you know, I think a lot of people were expecting a big year from Le'Veon Bell. He was taken in top two spots, I think, in most drafts. He's dropping probably a little this week. Tags, you know, with Bell not showing up here, um, how do you view him going forward, and how do you view James Conner? This is an ugly situation. Like, I mean, I mean, so many people are just like, wow, this is crazy. And I'm, I'm like, I'm just sitting back thinking, I want to see greatness. And Le'Veon Bell is great. And the, the thing is, I know there's people out there that say that the Steelers score points without Le'Veon, if you look at the splits, but they just score in different ways. I mean, this offense has so much firepower. You could argue that they've underperformed over the last couple of years just because, like, they have so many options here. The offensive line has been elite for multiple years now, and that's the part that's kind of overlooked. With that being said, they're going to play the Browns, and you know everybody wants to tie their opinion to the Browns, but this is a team that allowed 3.3 yards per carry last year to running backs, and that's like a large sample size. You know, when you look over a full season, I want to say that the the total amount of carries they faced was over 400. So that's a big sample size, a 3.3 yards per carry. And even if you look at Bell and Connor in that matchup, because it was Week One last year, it was in Cleveland. Those two combined for 43 yards on 14 carries. So it's not like it's a great matchup. You know, Jabril Peppers moving to strong safety it's going to help create even more of a a presence in the run game I I just don't love the matchup however when you're a defensive coordinator you game plan for Le'Veon Bell right so so when with Le'Veon Bell knowingly out of the lineup it seems like I have to assume that Greg Williams will adjust his game plan uh and that would that would assume like focusing more on stopping Antonio Brown who's gonna be matched up with some like some second tier cornerbacks or Denzel Ward is a rookie in his first game it's just a, a bunch to ask out of him so I think that Connor is going to be like a volume RB2 who could have some RB1 upside, but I'm not going to go like way out and just like say that he's a lock for all my tournament DFS lineups because of how cheap he is or anything like that. I just feel, I feel like he's going to be a volume RB2, uh, definitely worth a pickup, but he's worth more to the bell owner than he is to you, I think. And with these reports coming out that he's going to, that bell could potentially hold out until week 10, I'd be trying to get a King's ransom for, for James Connor right now. If you own him and the Le'Veon bell owner is panicking, See what you can get out of that deal because there's some crazy things floating out there. Makes sense. I mean, Woods, you were in the office all day long. You were following the story pretty closely. And as we mentioned, this story is one that could change by the hour. But what, what did you see today? What's the latest on it from your perspective? I mean, it, what we know is that Bell still hasn't signed his franchise tag, so he's not going to earn the $14.5 million on it until he signs, and he's going to lose money for every week that he's not there during the season. It's something like $850,000 a week if you do the math there. So I don't think he's going to want to lose too much money, but it is a value proposition for him. He wants to preserve his health and hit free agency after the season at full health. And remember, this is a player who's had multiple knee injuries in his past. He hyperextended his knee late in 2014 and missed the playoffs that season. Uh, the next year, he had a major PCL and MCL injury that cost him, I think, eight games, seven games maybe. So two big injuries in his past. He knows what it means to suffer an injury like that, and he wants to get through this season and hit free agency in prime position to make bank. But you ha- there, there are other factors at play here. I mean, I think you have to consider how Connor performs may impact when Bell shows up. If Connor flops in week one, suddenly Bell looks pretty good. If Connor comes out and has a big game, Maybe suddenly people start thinking, oh, it's more the offensive line than Bell. It hurts Bell's value, perceived value, at least a little bit entering free agency. So I just wonder how all these factors are going to come together. I I don't think Bell is going to sit out 10 games. I think this is probably a one-week or two-week thing where he makes his point and comes back. I mean, he talked all summer about having the best statistical season of his career. That's not going to be possible if he sits out multiple (laughs) games. But there's just so much up in the air right now and so much uncertainty that, I mean, I just don't really know what to think. Yeah, I mean, I am more than willing to, to play Connor. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm moving up him up into the low-end RB1 ranks. I do agree with you, though, Tags. I think if you can get maximum value for him right now in a trade, that's the smartest play because he's not going to hold this job all season long. It, it seems like it would be crazy for Bell to sit out more than a game. I, I would be shocked if he stays out longer than that, but we'll see how it goes. Connor's going to be in your lineup this week. What about Jordan Wilkins? Uh, As I mentioned earlier, Mac is going to be out. We haven't gotten official word, but it sure seems like he's going to be out. And everyone is projecting Wilkins to be the starter. Christine Michael's going to be there. It's it's hard to believe that we're still talking about Christine Michael in these conversations. Uh, Naheem Hines looked terrible in the preseason, but he could work in a bit. What's your take on the Colts backfield in week one, Tags? 
I feel like it's messy, and I think the Colts screwed up here. Is like there were so many running backs available in free agency in the draft this year that waiting so long, it just appeared that they were trying to go for that Doug Peterson approach, but they didn't have proven players in those roles. Like Darren Sproles is a proven player, and that's why they were able to use him in that. Corey Clement obviously filled in. The reason you kind of have to like Wilkins is because he does have a three-down skill set. I compared him uh, during my scouting process to a lesser version of Matt Forte, kind of like a player like he's just not flashy at all, but he can kind of get it done in all three downs, and that's what you want to like about Wilkins. The offensive line not blocking for any of them. None of the Colts running backs averaged more than 3.6 yards per carry in the preseason, which kind of tells you it's the offensive line working together. The continuity on an offensive line takes some time, and they have a whole lot of moving parts there. I think there's three new starting offensive lines lineman there so that's going to take time Wilkins the reason I think you have to like him is because he's he will work on the passing downs Naheem Hines fumbling three times in the preseason looking terrible on on obviously one two downs we didn't expect him to be that running back but it seems like he's far down the depth chart right now and Wilkins if the Colts were to fall behind in this game which I think most people are projecting that even though the the line in the game is still like two two and a half I'm projecting the, the Bengals to win this game, which would put them in more passing down situations, which which is why Wilkins moves up my chart a little bit. But I still think that I, th- I think it's very possible that Christine Michael gets more snaps than people realize in this game, just because I, I think they're going to want to split the, the work early down, early on. I don't think Wilkins did anything to to jump out at them and say, you have to play me. Uh, but it's it's just a messy situation where it's going to be a timeshare. But Wilkins, again, if you are if you own Mark Ingram or if you own one of these running backs like Le'Veon Bell and you're looking for a late a late round replacement, I think Jordan Wilkins will will justify, you know, that RB3 flex spot. I mean, and a big part of Wilkins' value is going to be how Andrew Luck looks. And you mentioned that offensive line could still be a problem here. It's something that Luck seems to have dealt with his whole career in, in Indianapolis. And we saw they're going up against the Bengals. Well, we saw the Bengals in week three in that regular season warm up against the Bills. They absolutely destroyed the Bills' offensive line. Now, that could also speak to just how bad the Bills' offensive line yeah. is this year. But. Do you think we're going to see the old Andrew Luck right out of the gate? Or, I mean, it's a negative thought to say this, but are we ever going to see the old Andrew Luck again? It's a great question. Uh, it's it's funny, and I did want to mention, I should have said that another positive for Jordan Wilkins is that Vontae's perfect is going to be out for the uh, Bengals on suspension. Yep. So it obviously hurts their already pretty weak linebacker core. Um, but Andrew Luck, it was funny. I was talking with uh, Andy Barons from Yahoo the other day, and he said that if Andrew Luck was a baseball player and we were talking about the surgery that he just had, it wouldn't be like, oh, is he going to return to his form? It's going to be, how much did he lose? You know, that's basically the conversation we'd be having. So he was basically saying he doesn't know why everybody's jumping back to say can Andrew Luck be the quarterback he once was he's not going to be that guy the question is can he make it work at like with 90 percent arm strength or whatever it is it's 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 a rough proposition and the, the reason I find it tougher than usual is because as we mentioned that offensive line has a lot of moving parts it's not solidified yet they have no continuity he doesn't have very good receivers I mean T.Y. Hilton is a, is a is a fine player but I don't think that he's the alpha dog that should be running an offense I think they should have had a possession style receiver added Ryan Grant I don't think he's that guy Deion Kane was I mean Deion Kane was the closest thing they had to a possession receiver and he's out for the year so I think Jack Doyle is the one that like if you're if you're looking for like someone to play in DFS this week or someone that you think is going to have a real good game I think Jack Doyle is going to become Andrew Luck's best friend if he wasn't already uh, and have a great game and if you if you if you're called Jack Doyle is the one who lit up the Bengals last year had the best game I think it was the best game of the season uh, for a tight end in PPR formats so Luck I, I'm not playing him this week if I can help it I have him ranked 16th quarterback just because I, I don't know how to feel about him and anybody that tells you that they know one way or the other is lying to you yeah, I agree. I, it's it's very hard to trust him right out of the gate here, and that's it's one of those one of those situations where we we want to see we want to see in week one. I'm assuming most people drafted a second quarterback if yeah. they took Andrew Luck, so I would think they'd have the opportunity to play that person this week. Hopefully, um, give them a little bit of give them a little time there. Woods, do you, you own Andrew Luck anywhere? I don't, and I think if you're looking for a Luck replacement, you maybe want to just look right across the field at Andy Dalton this week because that's yes, a pretty appealing matchup absolutely. for a quarterback streamer. For sure, yeah, one of the one of the worst defenses in the league, at least what we project to be one of the worst defenses in the league, and all those weapons with the Bengals and an improved offensive line as well. A lot, lot of things looking up for Dalton there. Talking about luck coming off of the injury, another player coming off an injury, albeit it's nowhere near as severe as Saquon Barkley. You know, we saw him rip it up early in the preseason, and then he had to sit out with the injury. Now he's getting a matchup with a tough, tough Jaguars defense in his NFL debut. How high are you ranking the 
I mean, we think he's going to be a star, the star rookie in week one here, Tags. Yeah, it's it's tough to play a rookie in his first game, playing behind a bad offensive line, coming off a hamstring injury, and playing against the Jags, right? Uh, but at the same time, the Jags are not – like when you talk about them being an elite defense, it's not because of their front seven in terms of the pa- uh, their their run stopping because they did allow 4.3 yards per carry last season. Like they they did they were they were pretty stout on the goal line. I think I think that they have a run defense that's that's solid. I don't think it's like elite where it's like you cannot run on this team. I think it's the one area where you can. But here's the reason that you have to like Barkley more than most running backs because. Every week he's going to run into this issue, right, where the defensive line that they're going against is going to be better than their offensive line. That's just going to happen because the Giants, even though they added two pieces in Will Hernandez and Nate Solder, it's still not a great offensive line, and it's going to take some time for them to develop, you know, to understand each other that the way that they work. But the reason that Barkley is so good is I think you saw it in that first preseason run. So many people want to say, oh, it was one run, but there was so much that we were able to see on that one run. We saw the offensive line break down. We saw him back up, and which is pretty much what we saw on tape with Barkley in college. He's willing to risk it all to blow up a run into like turn a small like a loss into a big one. That's what he's going to do. It was like when I talked about the Colts last year when I said that Frank Gore wasn't what the Colts needed last year going into the year. It was before the whole Andrew Luck thing even happened. I said this offensive line is bad enough. The the defense is going to be pretty terrible and they need him to step up. They need a player who can like basically be lightning in a bottle and give them a spark every now and then. Frank Gore belongs on a team that, you know, is like he's like a game manager as a running back where it's like if you get a lead, he can ride it out. He's not going to lose carries. Saquon Barkley is the absolute opposite. He is going to lose five yards at times. He's going to lose seven yards at times. But then he's going to break a 60-yard run, and you're going to be like, oh, my God, this is why everybody wanted to draft him. This is why the Giants took him number two overall. Not that I agree with them taking him at number two overall, but the kid does have talent. He he does show patience. He's a little bit bouncy in, in terms of like what he's looking for in, in a boom or bust run. But uh, with uh, Odell Beckham on the field, with Sterling Shepard out there, with Evan Ingram, he cannot be the sole – uh, focus of a defensive coordinator's game plan. So, so Saquon Barkley, I think, will be fine. I'm going to rank him as an RB1 this week. He does come with some additional risk due to the hamstring, but uh, that just means to me, don't play him in like DFS cash games. All right. Uh, another rookie back. Uh, I know that Woods and I have both been very high on him and throughout the offseason, but it's one of those situations where you kind of have to adjust going into the year here is carry on Johnson with the Lions. It doesn't appear as though he did enough during the preseason to win that starting job. You know, Woods, I know that we really hoped that he was going to have the starting role entering the year. Looks like we're going to have a dreaded committee here. How do you feel about carry on now? I mean, you know I'm a big carry-on fan. I'm trying to read between the lines of what the Lions offensive coordinator, Jim Bob Cooter, said this week about carry on. He said he's going to let his role develop. So what does that mean? I mean, that might mean... The Lions expect big things out of him and for that role to rapidly develop, and maybe they've been keeping him under wraps. I mean, he looked pretty good early in the preseason, and then we didn't really see a lot from him after that. It also might just mean that they don't expect much from him, and he's going to start from basically ground zero and have to work his way up and truly earn his carries on a a running back depth chart that is pretty loaded with not necessarily talent, but a lot of guys. I mean, there's LeGarrette Blunt is there. Theo Riddick is there. Amir Abdullah is, for some reason, still on that team. I mean, I, do, we, do we think he's going to be active in week one? I think maybe, but maybe he's only going to return kicks, but that's another obstacle in front of Johnson. So I'm still a real big fan of Johnson's talent. And as I've said, I don't think it's out of the question that we're going to see him have a rookie season that's you know a little bit akin to David Johnson's rookie season, where he had to get over veteran Chris Johnson and a receiving back in Andre Allington. To, fu- to really break out and he showed flashes of it early in the season and then the pieces just sort of all had to fall right for him he needed injuries there that might be what Johnson requires and late in the season Johnson emerges as a star but right now I think you got to stay away from him I'm pretty scared of everyone on the Lions backfield I think maybe you're considering playing Blunt under the hopes that he's going to score a goal line touchdown but I, I wouldn't even feel great about that there's just so much uncertainty there I wouldn't feel great about playing Blunt, but I I think people are overlooking him. I think he's a guy, this is going to be the time of year that he's the most fresh. We know what he can do at the goal line. We expect that the Lions offense is going to be able to score against the Jets here. It's a very winnable game for them. So I think Blunt is a guy that if if you need a flex, if you're someone, you know, if you're a Le'Veon Bell owner and you weren't lucky enough to have Connor and you have to just go grab somebody off the waiver wire, I think I'd be willing to, to go after him there. Tags, what do you think about the Lions backfield? 
I would vomit on my computer if I had to put LeGarrette Blunt in my lineup. Like, I, I legit would. Uh, I don't like LeGarrette Blunt for this offense at all. Like, I, I think Jim Bob Cooter saying, like, you know, on Johnson's role is going to develop. I think it means, like, I have to do what I'm told here, and we brought in LeGarrette Blunt, and I don't want him on my team. I really believe that this was not a Jim Bob Cooter. I, I don't think it was his signing. I think it had everything to do with Matt Patricia wanting to bring in his guy because LeGarrette Blunt does not fit this offense a single bit. Like, none. They want to run spread offense. They want to move fast. They want to run no huddle. They want to run out of the shotgun quite often. And LeGarrette Blunt does not fit in that offense. I It makes zero sense to me. I thought he was going to get cut, if I'm being honest. Uh, is he going to get goal line opportunities? Probably. I mean, that's what Patricia wants. But the thing is, LeGarrette Blunt is not a three-down running back. He's very He makes your offense very predictable, which is something the Lions, they under Jim Bob Cooter, they're not a predictable offense, and that's why they've had success. When you look at Carrion Johnson, the reason they drafted him is because he's a three-down back and he can get it done. They didn't have that one two-down back guy, and maybe they wondered if Carrion was going to be that guy early in his career if he can carry that load, you know, on first and second down because Theo Riddick and Amir Abdullah have shown they cannot, uh, especially behind their offensive line. So I don't know, man. Like this is a backfield I, I really want no part of in Week One because when you think about it, they started Amir Abdullah in a preseason. Like I, I thought it was like to showcase him for a trade before they potentially cut him. That wasn't what happened. So he's still on the roster. If he's active, I have to think he's going to have some sort of role. LeGarrette Blunt is doesn't fit the offense, so I don't want to play him and like hope for a touchdown. They're playing the Jets. The Jets run defense. You could say, I mean, Avery Williamson was added, but they took away Muhammad Wilkerson. There's some changes on the Jets. Um, Jamal Adams obviously is a strong safety coming down. He's strong. But I don't want to play anybody in this backfield in week one. I would much rather just sit back. Let's see how the timeshare plays out. I expect Kerryon Johnson to be the leader at year's end. But I think, as Jim Bob Cooter said, it's just going to take some time. Yeah, I think I'd be trying to add carry on if I could get him for cheap. Yes. I mean, I think it's just we haven't seen this three-down runner on Detroit for years now, and it's a situation that, to me, looks really ripe for a high-producing fantasy tailback. I mean, I think that's yep. a really good offensive line. It's just a good offense in general. They play on that fast track in Detroit. I, I, if they could ever get that player who stays on for all three downs and is a plus talent, which I think Johnson is, I mean, that's a fantasy gold mine potentially. It just has to develop over time here. Yeah, and hopefully it's not a, a black hole situation where we've just been waiting and waiting when are they going to have that running game? It hasn't showed up. Hopefully this year will be the year that it can emerge eventually. I think going back to Blunt, I think he's just a guy that is a, a long shot swing, though. I have them both ranked in the 30s. I, I really I think that there's a chance here that you don't want to just bet on touchdowns. But, you know, this could be one of those one, two touchdown games for Blunt where he all of a sudden comes out of nowhere and everyone scoops him up off the waiver wire. And then from this point on, almost like a Mike Gillisley last year sort of situation, you know, a big touchdown game at the beginning of the year, but not much after that. So I had to rank carry on lower than I wanted to, at least, you know, going back a couple of weeks, I expected I was going to have carry on higher in my rankings for week one. I had to do the same with Russell Wilson, and it's it's based on the fact that I think the Broncos' defense has some of its bite back. Uh, you know, their, their pass rush, I think, is going to be strong. Uh, they had some other additions on the defense there. And not to mention the questions that we have about the Seahawks' offensive line. Doug Baldwin's dealing with that injury. He's got a tough matchup with Chris Harris. Tags, are you, are you downgrading Wilson? Are you downgrading anybody on the Seahawks in this matchup? Yeah, it's really tough for me because I own Wilson in a few places because he was one of the few quarterbacks. Like, if I can get Rodgers or Wilson, I was willing to spend, like, a, a sixth-round pick on Wilson. Uh, but this matchup is not good. It's not good at all. Um, like, obviously, when you have Von Miller and Bradley Chubb on the perimeter against that offensive line, it's just not going to end well. Uh, they bring pressure, and that's just basically – their secondary kind of let them down last year, but I don't think that the Seahawks have answers – for the holes they have in their secondary. The Seahawks' best receiver, as you mentioned, is Doug Baldwin. He's going to match up with Chris Harris in the slot. That's that's just not a good matchup. Even if Doug Baldwin was 100%, it's a bad matchup. Uh, you look at the wide receivers, Brandon, 34-year-old Brandon Marshall, is he going to start? Like, what are we doing? I, I have no idea what the Seahawks are doing with that. I think Jerron Brown should be the starting wide receiver, along with Tyler Lockett, obviously in three wide receiver sets. But I don't know what they're doing. I, I'm, I'm concerned about the offensive coordinator. Brian Schottenheimer was brought in to run this offense for whatever reason. Uh, I, I don't know. But I think the, the thing is, is like uh, with Russell Wilson, you have to add in the factor that Wilson's been really like he can create fantasy points with his legs. It's almost like Cam Newton's a bad passer almost every single week, but he ends up a decent fantasy option because he uses his legs. I think Russell Wilson obviously will have to do that this year more than I think he wants to. Um but man, it's it sucks because I don't feel like great about many quarterbacks like playing over him. Like I would personally probably play Andy Dalton over him, 
But anybody else that's available on the waiver wire, I couldn't start them over Russell Wilson. So I, when looking at my rankings, I had him in my top 10 still just because I do think he's going to add rushing totals. But another thing to, to kind of take into consideration is that he's been really bad uh, over the first couple weeks of the season. Like I think it's like three or four years running now where Russell Wilson almost always starts slow. I yep. just I'd feel a lot better about Russell Wilson this week and moving forward this season if we had a little more confidence in Doug Baldwin. I'm just really worried about that knee. He missed so much of the summer with this sore knee. What does that really mean? I mean, that's the type of thing that I think could hamper him all season and maybe after a few weeks he's going and getting it cleaned out and he's out for, you know, four to six weeks kind of thing. That 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 does sort of hang over us. Right now we tentatively think he's going to be able to play through it, but you just you don't like when your fantasy player is, sits all summer with soreness. Are you just trying to get back at me for the James Conner thing because you know that I own Baldwin in that same league? Just trying to drive it into my heart. <laughs> no, here. I want nothing but the best for Doug Baldwin. I hope he's fully healthy. I hope I hope every player is fully healthy. So another quarterback, and oddly enough, the last time we saw this quarterback, uh, he was just having a monster game against the Seahawks. It was that crazy game where both teams were going up and down the field last year. Talking about Deshaun Watson. He had 402 passing yards, four touchdowns, and 67 yards on the ground during that game last year. Just a huge, huge fantasy day. He tore his ACL later that week in practice. You know, what should fantasy owners expect, not just from Watson, I guess, but from this whole Texans offense? I think I particularly am pretty excited about it. I know their offensive line is an issue, and hopefully it's not an issue that's going to sink the whole offense like we've seen happen on other teams in the past looking at you know the Bengals last year, the team that happened to. Uh, Tags, what do you think is going to happen with Watson coming out of the gate? Uh, he, I mean, he has, he has a decent matchup. The Patriots' defense, obviously, losing Mike Vrabel, losing, Mike, uh, losing uh, Matt Patricia to the Lions, their defense is going through some changes. And they also, I mean, for a defense that really let down, um, I, I would say anyone last year, they, they were not a good defense for, uh, last year. They didn't really add much. I mean, they added Adrian Claiborne, uh, defensive end from the Falcons, but he wasn't like a full-time player last year for the Falcons. And then they added Jason McCourty. Uh, they went out and they traded for uh, Danny Shelton from the Browns. So I don't know if there was, there's enough difference that the Patriots have made to the roster. The, the concern I have for Watson this week is like a, a game control offense for the Patriots because they don't have the receivers to like take advantage of a weak secondary that the Texans produce. They do bring pressure. I think it's a very, I think it's a very slow moving Patriot offense this week. I think that they want to move the ball via the passing game, like through like James White and Rex Burkhead. And that's kind of where I'm at where I, I know that the line on this game is really high. It's like one of the highest over-unders of the week. The last time these two teams played, it was 36-33. It was also like, that was the time, that was like almost like the Deshaun Watson breakout game where before that he was looked at as kind of a joke because when he came in in week one and replaced Tom Savage, he looked terrible. Like he was really bad that game. And I want to say that the game against the Patriots was one of the, the first ones where he actually played pretty well. I think he threw a couple touchdowns and an interception or two. Um, but he's a very volatile passer, and I think we're going to continue to see that. His mobility is going to be a little limited by the ACL. I mean, we, we're still seeing Carson Wentz, who got hurt just a couple weeks later, is not even playing in week one. So I think it just says something about what to expect about his mobility. Um, the wide receivers are obviously really good there. So I just I worry more about the Patriots' offense killing the clock and just basically taking their time with the ball. Uh, so I like Watson. I have him as a QB one. I have him, I think, as my number five quarterback this week. But I don't think it's going to be like a 36-33 game like it was last year against the Patriots. I have him as my QB four. I, I do like him this week. I, I think, like you mentioned, that game last year, not that you could just straight up go back to that, but you were right. 300 yards. He had over 300 yards, two touchdowns. He threw two picks, but another 41 yards on the ground. We don't know what that rushing ability is going to be like early in the season. We didn't see him run too much during the preseason there. Uh, Woods, are you starting Watson anywhere? Uh, no, you, we've discussed Watson on this podcast. I think the regression is coming for him, and I just didn't draft him anywhere, so I won't start him. I think you know there's concern there that Bill Belichick with a second shot at him will figure some things out, knowing that Watson probably isn't going to be as mobile as last year. I mean, almost certainly won't be. Maybe the defense, even though, the, as Tag said, the personnel is not great, maybe they find different schematic ways to sort of limit what Watson can do, make him go on the move. So I'd be a little concerned about him there. I mean, if you drafted him, you're obviously starting him. I would just temper expectations. And one of the things that I've brought up as well before is – the schedule. Yes, you might look at the Patriots and say that's a, a tough game for them this week, but that Texans schedule is very easy throughout this season. So I think the Texans offense is going to be able to just roll some teams and, and put up some big totals. It's another reason why I liked Watson, though I think he probably ADP wise probably went too high in, in most places. 
one of my favorite parts of week one, and I wish that they would do this all year long, is the doubleheader on Monday night. It's just fantastic. I don't know if you guys feel the same. I believe you guys both have kids, so maybe you don't want to stay up that late <laughs> for that, that late game out there. But this week in that late game, we're going to see the Rams and the Raiders. I mentioned it before with, with Marshawn. You know, a little worried about that Raiders team and just mentally where they're at after the trade. Looking at them this week, I think the Rams are going to be a, a juggernaut. I, I just I don't think people are talking about it enough. I think when some of those moves happen in the offseason, everyone was discussing, you know, wow, this is just a super team. It seems like that's quieted down a little bit, but going into the season, I don't feel like people are really talking about it too much here. I mean, that might be good management by the Rams who are just sort of trying to kill that narrative, which obviously hasn't, you know, didn't benefit the Eagles on that dream team season. So that, that may just be some, some savvy management of expectations on the Rams part. And I mentioned it earlier, you know, the Rams weren't great against the run last year, but it's a pretty loaded defense in, in a game that I think they're going to win. How are you approaching the Raiders offense tags? Oh, a huge um, sigh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it really stinks because they have a good offensive line and it should be able to do some damage. But the issue is that, I mean, if you're constantly behind in games, you're not even going to be able to take advantage of the best part of that line, is which is the run blocking. They're like a really good run blocking unit. And obviously, Marshawn Lynch looked really, uh, really good in the preseason. Like, I, I think that the reason that we saw him down the stretch kind of like come into his own was because I think he was a little bit out of shape and nobody really wanted to say it because it was Marshawn Lynch. But I think he got into better shape shape in this offseason knowing he was uh gonna essentially be competing with Doug Martin who is like J John Gruden's boy um Marshawn Lynch looks great he looks in great shape and I, I wanted to want to draft him but the more that this goes on it's like what did John Gruden do to this roster I I don't know what they're doing now they're now the NFL's oldest team in a team that seems like they're in rebuilding mode which is really odd because when you have an old roster typically you're in like you're going to be competing the line on this game is really weird because it was like a three and a half, which d didn't seem right, which odds makers usually have like Intel behind the scenes that I don't know, but it, it, it's, it's recent after they traded Khalil Mack, it's gone up to five, which is it's, it's, it's getting better because it's a, it, it seems like it should be a blowout. I'm with you, Justin, the fact that the Rams, people are forgetting how, just how good they can be. And while some people want to say, oh, teams are going to figure out that Sean McVay offense, I don't think so. I don't think they will. Why do I think that? Because I think Sean McVay is a smart dude. I think that he uh, what goes into the offseason and says, whatever worked in 2017, it doesn't mean it's going to work in 2018. So we're going to change some things up. I, I think they may add the tight end into the offense a little bit more. I think Brandon Cooks is going to add a different element than Sammy Watkins did because Watkins clearly just didn't get the offense. And it seems like we're getting a similar situation in Kansas City where he was very rarely targeted in the preseason. I just don't know if Sammy Watkins, it just takes a long time for him to understand an offense. I don't know. But either way, Sean McVay has shown what a difference a coach can make, and I, I believe in him. I believe in that defense. They may take some time on defense to kind of come into their own and because there's a lot of moving parts there. There's so many different players uh, starting for them. The only Raiders players that I would consider starting, I mean, Marshawn Lynch, you want to play him just because – Again, there's some there's some things that have changed in that defensive line where it could take some time where they learn each other and their tendencies. And then Amari Cooper, but even Amari's matchup against LA is not great with Marcus Peters and Aqib Talib on the perimeter and them saying that Seth Roberts is the slot guy. I, I kind of knew this was coming, though, because Seth Roberts is still on the roster. They traded away Ryan Switzer. They... I, I have no idea what they're doing. Like, that's be that's basically the best answer I can give. I have no idea what the Raiders are doing, so why should you want to play them in fantasy? We'll have to pass that on to uh, Dan Wilkins, who works with us here. He's our red resident Raiders fan. He'll be very upset to hear you say <sighs> that. It's frustrating, man. I'm, a, I'm like the biggest Amari Cooper fan Amari Cooper fan you will find. I just feel like he's in the terrible situation with a, with a not-so-great quarterback and now with a terrible coach. Well, I took him in the, the Fantasy Pros Dynasty League, and I've just watched his value drop a little bit here, so I'm also a little upset about that. All right, let's, let's rattle through a couple quick ones just before we let you go here. Give me a player or some players, if you want, that you think that fantasy owners might be overlooking in week one. I think Josh Doxson is a player that I'm not even – like, I wasn't huge into drafting him or anything like that, but the Cardinals have said that they're not going to use Patrick Peterson in shadow coverage, which means that Doxson, where he typically lined up last year – He's going to be matched up with Jamar Taylor uh, on the right side of the formation. And Jamar Taylor is 5'11", and he allowed a 111.4 quarterback rating in his coverage throughout his five years in the NFL. So that's not like a small sample size. Uh, Josh Doxson, 6'3", has a 41-inch vertical. 
I don't think he meshes well with Alex Smith in terms of what he does and what Alex Smith does, but I think this could be a week where people are like, oh, J- Josh Doxson's really good. Um, I, I, th- I like him as a high upside wide receiver for this week. And then another one is Nick Vanette. Uh, nobody realizes that uh, Jimmy Graham and um, – Luke Wilson and Paul Richardson accounted for 20 touchdowns of the 34 that Russell Wilson threw last year. And they didn't really replace the production. Like they went and got Brandon Marshall again. He's 34. He's not doing anything. He was more on the roster bubble than I was worried about him making a fantasy impact. Nick Vanette has looked really good in the time they've played him. He's 6'6", 260 pounds. Uh, he's an athlete. They drafted him in the third round. So they obviously liked him. They've kept Ed Dixon on the, he's not even on the active roster. And then going against the Broncos, they allowed 10 tight end one performances last year. That ranked third to only the Giants and the Browns, and everybody plays the tight ends against them. Knowing that Nick Vanette looked good in the preseason, knowing that he knows uh, he has some chemistry with Russell Wilson where there's a lot of these other guys that are trying to kind of figure out their role, I think Nick Vanette could be an awesome streamer. I like it. Woods, how about you? Anybody you think people are overlooking? Uh, I'm not going to go as deep for this one, but I just want to make the case that if a breakout is ever coming for Derrick Henry, maybe we see a bit of it this week. He's someone who just a lot of the shine came off him this offseason. Obviously, the Titans signed Deion Lewis, and though their ADPs didn't – Henry remained above him getting drafted earlier – sort of just among the industry fantasy analysts everybody was kind of on Dion Lewis I think this might be a week where we see it from Henry he picks up where he left off in the playoffs uh, the Titans are playing the Dolphins they have a very young linebacking core who just maybe mm-hmm. isn't that great inexperienced Rashard Matthews and Delaney Walker were both hurt in camp they're both expected to play but I'm not sure the Titans can lean on them too heavily it's gonna be a hot day in Miami new coaching staff for the Titans I think that might be a game where they just say let's come out and pound this opponent and that means potentially a lot of Derrick Henry and I think we could see a big day for him Yep. Uh, I will go I will go deeper for mine and and like we mentioned before these probably are guys you don't want to start but there's going to be some people out there some Le'Veon Bell owners who are going to have to find someone to slot in and one is a guy I mentioned before which is LeGarrette Blunt. we went over that another guy in a similar situation is Latavius Murray who we've heard a lot of reports that Murray's going to get goal line work that they're going to use Murray more early in the season and they're going to ease Dalvin Cook back in I could see Murray coming out. He looked really good in the preseason. I could see him coming out and having a big game, scoring a touchdown, and being usable in fantasy this week. What about any stars out there that you guys think uh, that you guys don't want a part of this week? I just I'd look on the other side of that Vikings game. I'm I'm very scared of playing 49ers in this mm-hmm. in week one. Yeah. I I think I'd be benching Jimmy Garoppolo, Marquise Goodwin. I'm not sure I want any part of that. The Vikings defense just looks way too scary for me. Tags, how about yeah. you? I had Goodwin on my list as well. I mean, we talked about Doug Baldwin. Uh, He's someone that I'm not particularly excited about. Now, if I had him, I probably wouldn't bench him, but I view him as like a a wide receiver three more than I do a wide receiver one. Uh, Chris Harris Jr. is just so good. The last player I wanted to mention was Devonta Freeman. Uh, This turned into more of a timeshare than most realized last year. Freeman totaled more than 12 carries just two times after week four. And one of those games came when Tevin Coleman was out of the lineup against the Bucs. So... I mean, when you look at this, it's more of like a 55-45 timeshare than most realize. Uh, you know, looking at the Eagles last year, they there were just four games last year where they allowed an RB1 performance that ranked as the fifth best in the NFL. It, it's likely because they only allowed five rushing touchdowns and four of them came in two games. Uh, but Freeman is in more of a timeshare than people think. He's been a better running back at home where every single time they play at home, it's like he's scoring a touchdown where his road numbers have have not looked as good and I think that comes down to him playing at home on the turf inside the dome whereas outside his footing isn't as sharp with his low center of gravity and his cuts so Devonta Freeman is someone that's probably going to let his fantasy owners down I like that you're saying that tags because I have been very high on Tevin Coleman this year and I think in a contract year I, I do agree with you that I don't think people realize how much of a timeshare that is and I, I think they're going to work Coleman a lot this year. They're going to work him a lot to the end of that contract because I don't know if they're bringing him back or not. And Woods, you and I have talked about it. You made the same point. It's the reason why Le'Veon Bell's staying out, right? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of – it's great when you're when you're a fantasy owner of a player who a team just wants to use and run him at carry after carry to get as much out of him as they can. But in the case of Bell, I think that's what he fears from the Steelers. He's staying away because he knows he's probably in a contract year. They're going to run him into the ground if they can. But hey, Coleman's there, so use him. Yeah. And in my bold predictions article recently, I said that I think there's a chance that Coleman is going to outscore Freeman this year straight up, not talking about an injury happening or anything like that, just straight up. Because I think it's pretty close. Even their numbers like last year, it wasn't far off where, uh, where Coleman ended up behind Freeman there. So, I mean, 
We're clearly a little bit worried about Devonta Freeman this week. One guy we are never worried about is Mike Tagliere. You can find him on Twitter at Mike Tagliere NFL tags. Big thank you for coming on. Always enjoy talking football with you. No, thanks for having me on, guys. I'm always down to talk some football as long as as long as I have the, the time. And in season, it just gets crazy. So I'm I'm happy we were able to make this work for week one and. Uh, Next time, I better be invited in studio. <laughs> awesome. Well, Tags is going to be the first of many guests that we're going to have on these Thursday preview podcasts. So make sure that you're subscribing. That's going to guarantee that you're going to get the podcast as soon as it goes up. Woods and I are going to be back on Monday morning, breaking down all the action from week one. And we're going to give you an early look at some targets you should be grabbing on the waiver wire for next week. If you want to get in touch with Woods or if you want to just commiserate with him about losing uh, James Conner, you can reach him. No, where don't Woods. remind me. Please don't remind me. It's at David P. Woods, but please, guys, don't remind me. I really don't want to think about it. And fire all your questions to me on Twitter, at Justin Boone, and we will see you next time. Said leave on time, my baby. Said leave on time.